Hey, everybody, everybody, welcome, welcome. Yes, it is Monday, April 24th, 2023. It is a special 1 p.m. In the afternoon, 1 p.m. in the afternoon version of Raging Chickens Out to Coop Live. Yes, indeed it is. This is Kevin Mahoney, creator and founder of Raging Chicken. On Out to Coop Live, we talk to progressives, activists, and troublemakers of all sorts, right from our own backyards from across the country. You can also join us at the end of the week for our Friday Politics Roundup, where we break down the good, the bad, and the ugly in state and national politics. You can get all our shows by subscribing to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. You can help support this show by becoming a patron for as little as five bucks a month. Head on over to patreon.com slash RC press for all the details, or you can help out the show by heading over to our YouTube channel. If you're not there already, smash that subscribe button, like the stream for the show and hit that notification bell. So, you know, every time that we go live for more PA progressive talk, tune into the Rick Smith shows live stream at 9 PM Eastern, wherever you get your streams, Rick's going to be there. Let's face it. And make sure you subscribe to his podcast wherever you get your podcasts. For all the details, head on over to the ricksmithshow.com for the latest across all his platforms. And if you haven't checked out the Sisters of the Night Caucus podcast, I don't know what you're waiting for. The amazing PA women stirring the political cauldron behind this podcast rock the house. And they know where the bodies are buried. Make sure to follow them on Twitter at, at the Night Caucus. That's at the Night Caucus on Twitter. And subscribe to their podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Yes, indeed. And if you haven't heard the signal, yes, the signal, the signal is a, wait, I'm going to do something real quick here, everybody. All right, there we go. The signal is a new podcast from the Bucks County Beacon. Yes, the signal is hosted by the Beacon's editor-in-chief, Cyril Michaleko, and produced by yours truly. Yes, indeed. Yes. What do they do on the signal? Well, um, twice a month, the signal will shine a light on the right-wing extremist currents streaming through Bucks County and beyond. <clears throat> Cyril invites guests to provide insight, analysis, and organizing solutions so that we can steer the community toward calmer, saner, progressive roots. Check out the information on that at the buckscountybeacon.podbean.com, or you can get him, get that show, wherever you get your podcast. And for all you gamers out there, the Quakertown-based black family-owned gaming store called The Game In, yes, The Game In with two N's, like they're friends of the show, they've got everything for Retro N64s, the latest for all consoles, video games for all platforms, collectibles, action figures, Funko Pops, walls of Funko Pops, and kids get discounts with every A on the report card. Check them out on their Facebook page and follow them on Twitter at, at the Game In. that's with two N's. Got a question about a game, looking for something hard to get, shoot them a message or drop them an email at thegameinpa at gmail.com. And a special shout out goes to Jonathan Mann who wrote our intro song, There Are No People in the Future. Check out all his great stuff and follow him on his YouTube page or follow him on his Twitter at Song of Day Man. That's at Song of Day Man on Twitter, again with two N's. And with all this craziness happening in our communities, we cannot let Paul Martino and his oligarch friends buy our schools and push extremist politics in our community. Raging Chicken has teamed up with Level Field to launch a truly community-rooted PAC to invest in organizing, supporting local and statewide progressive candidates, and unmasking the toxic organizations injecting our communities with right-wing extremism. We're putting small-dollar donations to work to beat back the power of big money. You can get more information and drop your donation at ragingchicken.levelfield.net. We've got some great shows coming up um, on May 8th. Uh, next week, we still got like two or three possibilities, but on May 8th, I welcome Mark Engler to the show. Mark uh, is a Philly-based writer, and he's author of This Is an Uprising, How Nonviolent Revolt is Shaping the 21st Century, and a member of the editorial board of Dissent. And we're going to be talking about his latest article, Can Movements Keep Politicians from Inevitably Selling Out, which appears in Dissent, The Forge, and Waging Nonviolence. But that's not until the 8th. We're here, here for this show, right? And on today's show, in this episode of Out to Coop Live, I welcome Francois Furstenberg to the show. Francois is a professor of history at Johns Hopkins University. 
and we'll be talking about his latest article in the Chronicle of Higher Education, Higher Ed's Grim, Soulless, Ed Techified Future. I am depressed already, right? Um, but he's looking at te um, Temple's Jason Wingard, how he champions skillification. Now, he may be out, but his vision lives on. And in, wake, in the wake of the unabashed anti-union tactics during the recent Temple University Graduate University strike um, and an overwhelming vote of no confidence by the faculty union, Temple University President Jason Wingard resigned. However, as we'll talk about today, Wingard's ideas for higher education will, in the words of Furstenberg, quote, continue marching across the landscape of higher education like zombies, transformed the con transforming the content and purpose of curricula in the image of our post-industrial financialized moment, unless a broader coalition is mobilized to stop them. Francois has been a professor of history at Johns Hopkins University since 2014. He previously taught at the Université de Montréal. My French is like, forget about it, so I apologize in advance. Uh, from 2003 to 2013, he is the author of various books and articles on early American and Atlantic history, as well as co-author on a college text textbook. He began writing essays on the state of higher education during the pandemic in 2020, when he became alarmed by the corporatization of American universities. His writing on the topic can be found at the Chronicle of Higher Education, the American Prospect, and the AAUP's magazine and blog. Welcome to the show, Francois. Well, thank you so much for having me here. It's a pleasure to be chatting with you. Well, you know, like I said, I said to you a little bit before the show is that uh, I know that uh, when I read your article, I'm like, man, do we need this kind of uh, writing right now? Um, for those folks who know, you know, I'm in the state steps of higher education, teach at Kutztown University, and we're seeing we're in a contract fight of ourselves. And the guy who's at the head of the state steps of higher education, Chancellor Dan Greenstein, you know, is, comes out of this big tech world. Um, and um, so that's very much on a lot of folks' minds as we're facing our contract stuff. But this is kind of really much broader than our fight. We're seeing this kind of nationwide here. So let me ask you this, before we even get rolling on what you have at the center of your piece, I mean, you know, like I said in the intro, you know, you're a guy, you're a history guy writing on early American Atlantic history. And now you're talking about Jason Wingard and the Silicon Valley kind of like hucksterism. So maybe we could just start there just for folks. Like, how did you get and find your way to this path to that you want to be focusing on someone like Jason Wingard in this book and um, and what he's proposing for higher education? Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for asking the question and starting there, because it's true that that um, this is not, you know, there's a lot of people who are very smart people and very knowledgeable people who write about higher ed. And um, I've been in communication with with uh, with many of them and they're, you know, they're impressive scholars. Um, but this is not my field. I am an early American historian. I'm trained as in early American Atlantic history. Um, I mostly, you know, the more time I spend in the 18th, 19th century, the happier I am. Uh, the tw 21st century is a depressing place to, to be, as far as I'm concerned, so get me out. Um, uh, but, but you know, of course I, I live and, and I work in, in the modern day academy. And, and um, in the end, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to detach. I mean, what, much as one might sort of imagine being a kind of uh, a scholar, you know, ensconced in a kind of ivory tower and, and unaffected by, by um, issues of the day. I mean, we do we do all live and work in certain material conditions, right? In certain institutions, right. Um, and um, and of course, you know, we spend an awful lot of our time teaching and, and doing other kinds of service related work. And so, actually, in in many ways, this all comes out of my um, I would say kind of service component of my work. That is to say, I got you know, you, you're always dragged into different kinds of committees, and and um, and as you get as you get promoted, you just get, <laughs> you get asked to do more and more in the university. So I got put on one committee after another, and over time, um, internally getting a little depressed by finding that the, the the sort of committee work that I did, which is, you know, asked to participate and to study some issue and make a set of recommendations for, for kind of internal, you know, the set, it, internal direction of the university was, um, uh, it, it became quite clear that that an awful lot of that work is, is sort of made up work. It's sort of a Potemkin, you know, uh, 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 exercise in, in sort of self-governance. But in reality, the decision very often it was quite clear that decisions had already been made even before any recommendations of any you know of committees that I was part of um, uh, were uh, you know were issued and decided upon. Um, and so you know I, I 
repeatedly thought to myself, you know, what am I doing here? Why, why are all these right. people kind of wasting their time in really good faith and spending all this time studying issues if, if the decisions are going to get made? And over and over again, anytime I was part of a committee, people would say, well, you're purely advisory. Of course, the final decision rests with the president and board of trustees. Well, okay, you know, but usually, usually whoever's making the decision waits to get advice and recommendations before deciding whether or not to listen to that. <laughs> you know, like, yep. It doesn't usually happen before. <laughs> um, so anyway, so, so that was the kind of background context. And then, um, and then when the, when the, you know, and also the other thing I'll say is just, just general impression that the people who do ultimately make the decisions um, and that, you know, in an institution like my own, it's, it's the board of trustees is ultimately um, the, the, the body that really makes all those kinds of decisions. Any, any important decision for the university has to go through the board of trustees, including my own tenure, let's say, or my own promotion. Right. Um, and so, um, so, so my increasing sense that, that the people who sit on that board and, the, and those are the people who hire the president uh, of the university, who then hires all the vice presidents, you know, and all the other uh, who runs the administrative operation of the university, those people um, really are quite detached from the actual function of the university. Uh, you know, the, we spend our time teaching um, and doing research. And those are the, as I see it, you know, those are the main functions of the university, teaching and research. Um, and, um, and the people who are the final deciders are people who, you know, who come from completely different worlds, finance, uh, corporations, from the, from the law, sometimes from government. Um, and um, and they, they know very little about the university. And, and it would be one thing if they actually, you know, engaged with the people who are doing the actual work of the university. Um, but, but they seem quite uninterested in the opinions of the people who actually know what happens in a university and what a university is fundamentally about. So, so there was a kind of, um, I would say that's the that's the underpinning of my my experience um, within the kind of institutional functioning of uh, of various um, of the of the institutions where I was working, and and then when the pandemic hit, um, this materialized for me in a very concrete way. So mm -hmm. the pandemic hit, and all kinds of stuff was happening very quickly. I mean, it was a very chaotic moment, and I don't necessarily blame institutions for responding the way they did. Nobody knew what to do. Right. Um, but but at my institution, Johns Hopkins, which you know uh, I get told over and over again is uh, is is very wealthy. Uh, you know our president is incredibly successful. He keeps raising more money. We keep we're growing. We're successful. We're wonderful. We're great. Um, and uh, within I think it was some four to six weeks after the pandemic hit, uh, the the university responded by taking a series of really quite drastic measures. I thought, um, and some of these you know seemed. Some of them seem sort of reasonable, like uh, hiring freezes or, or salary freezes. I mean, that's not crazy. Um, some of them seemed a little hasty, layoffs and, and other kinds of things. And some of them seemed downright, um, uh, they seemed, they struck me as illegal. I mean, I, I assume they weren't, but, but they, I, you know, so, so the, the one that really hit home was uh, the university decided it was going to freeze our pension contributions. You know, we, all, we don't have a... I don't know if you in the Pennsylvania state system have a, a, a real pension. I used to have when I was at the University of Montreal because, you know, Canadian. Um, <laughs> but but uh, we have just contributions into our, uh, for, you know, the equivalent of a 401k. It's a 403b. And the university uh, has some required contribution. I, I thought this was part of my contract. Um, and uh, and they, they announced that they were freezing that. And, and all that stuff, you know, they, they said we're looking at deficits of in the hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, coming up. And I, and I thought, wow, this is this is awfully fast to, to be making these kinds of decisions. You know, nobody knows what's going to happen. I can understand being prudent, but but this seems as though it's really jumping the gun. Right. Um, and, you know, and, and so the, the way that I framed it in my head, the way that I was experiencing that is this was a kind of, you know, shock doctrine, disaster totally. capitalism, right? 100%. Um, this is, you know, th these are a bunch of people who sit on our trustees who think, why do we give such generous benefits to our employees? That's crazy. Uh, that's a waste of money. We 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 cut that out long ago in places like you know in our the companies you know that we bought in my private equity firm or whatever, <laughs> and we've looted those pensions ages ago. Right, right. Um, right. <laughs> why are we still doing that here? Uh, and so, so you know, here an opportunity seemed to come along, and and, uh, and they were obviously ready with the measures to take. Um, and this seems, you know, this seems. Uh, astonishing to me because these were extreme measures uh, without any input from anybody who was affected by them. Uh, there, there is a there is a sort of faculty advisory budget committee, um, but no, it's not an elected body. And I've spoken to some of the people who sit on that, and they say that their voices aren't listened to anyway. So, um, so they're told again what's what's going to you know they're told about decisions that get made sort of before they're announced. But that's that's that have got that have been made before they're announced. Um, but it, in no way is that a governance body, right? So so anyway. Um, so these so these decisions got made uh, very quickly in a very hasty way in a very non-participative kind of way, um, 
and um, in ways that seemed uh, to, to move in only one direction. Uh, that is to say, you know, slashing benefits, you know, you know, slashing labor costs. Uh, and so, so this was, um, you know, this was a kind of wake up call for for me. Uh, and you know, even in my very tenured position, sheltered position um, at a wealthy university. Uh, it turns out that you know an eight billion dollar endowment. I don't know what the number is. I'm making that up, but some, something like that. You know, it turns out that being the largest employer in the state of Maryland, it turns out that being that that owning half of the city of Baltimore um, right. is not enough to protect you to protect you from you know quite draconian cuts it, when the mood um, hits them, right? Uh, so 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 it was all you know that that was a sort of so so that began my um, I guess my career or at least it. it ratcheted up my career as a um as a troublemaker is how i like to think about it um and you know somebody who who writes about and 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 speaks about um uh, these issues of university governance and ways in which ways in which um i mean the, the the broader theme of everything that i that i have been writing about this i think is um is that our universities are not corporations and they for too long now they have been run as though they are for profit corporations they're run by the same kinds of people um, people who come out of that world, uh, who know about that world, and don't know much about the world of higher education, um, and and those are the people who are, who are running our system, and they're running it into the ground. That's what I'm worried about. Yeah, and I think that's um, there's every reason to be concerned about that for sure. Um, you know, a, a couple quick anecdote, anecdotes on this one. One, I think. You know, you mentioned about you know people predeciding things um, after they ask for faculty input. And I always think about, you know, it seems like the data that they're looking for from faculty, they've already made a decision, then they're looking to backfill the data to kind of support what they've already decided to do. Um, and when the data doesn't comport to what they said, they just ignore it. And I remember I used to be the, the head of our composition program at Kutztown University. And for the longest time, we kept on hearing we need data about like these particular programs. We had an introduction to college composition for first generation college students or students who were struggling with their writing, right? That was a four credit class, but it was an elective class. So, and we had this directed self placement program, all this stuff. And they said, well, we, you know, we knew they wanted to get rid of it, but we're like, okay. Um, but it was, well, this shows that this stuff works. And they're like, well, we need data. So we went out, we did the research because we're academics and we do research and we went out and find best practices. We looked at a variety of programs across the country. We presented them back with data, right? Went to a meeting and turns out they hadn't read the report that we had given them, right? And then basically said, well, this is nice, but this is not from Kutztown. Like as if Kutztown is somehow and like, you know, its own little micro universe that it does not obey the laws of physics, that somehow we need only data from Kutztown to determine whether or not it's successful or not. It was like the most absurd thing I've ever heard. But it was like, and we see that as a pattern. And again, it's not, I don't mean to suggest, it's just Kutztown. That's just exactly the kind of thing that we see over and over again. Our chancellor just did this with uh, the consolidation of uh, universe, six universities into two. I had all these like workshops and faculty workshops and worker workshops and student workshops. And they just went on and ignored that to the point where when they gave the presentation about consolidation, instead of actually having student voices represented at the Board of Governors, he made up, right, representative students to tell the stories, right? I mean, it was just insane. But anyways, the, the irony of your story and Johns Hopkins is here is exactly when you said this is a shock doctrine policy, I hear this, I, that's exactly how I heard what you were saying. And not only that, um, you know, the irony of it is that Johns Hopkins was the go to place to get COVID data. Right. So on the one hand, you had this is the, the institution that became central. And you would think there would be enough people that would say, hey, you know what? We don't know what the hell's going on here. We just need to kind of like keep the ship in like going forward in the way that it is. Let's not make any crazy changes. Let's not fire people. Let's make sure that we can deliver what we're doing. But instead, they do something very different. I was just going to say, you know, just to, just to bounce back on what you're saying. I mean, I think, you know, I, I've I've wondered back and forth whether this is a, sort of an intentional strategy when you bring faculty in, right? In, in an ideal world, or at least I don't know. If, I, I'm I'm wondering if this is really the ideal world, but if, in the in the model that has um, existed to date, right? Which which I take from the AAUP, American University Professors, um, university governance is a kind of three-legged uh, stool. You know, it's it's made up of multiple components that kind of work together, right? So you've got You've got the board of trustees. Um, you've got the university administration, uh, who's the president, and, uh, president, and everyone else. And, and you've got um, the faculty, right? And these and these all have their main. Um, they've all they've all got their main responsibilities, and they've all got their main functions. But they all work together as a kind of check and balance, right? Uh, system, and ideally they collaborate and, and uh, so on. But um, but 
you know, in my mind, that three-legged stool has been kind of kicked apart uh, in particular so, so that the board of trustees and the president uh, and the board of trustees ultimately oversees the president. And everything the board of trustees knows comes through the president's office, uh, at least in my institution, but I think in many institutions. So uh, meanwhile, the faculty have been more and more uh, pushed aside. Uh, and, um, and, you know, you talk about the experiences that you've had of, of sitting on committees where decisions are, <laughs> where the data is irrelevant, right? Decisions have been made. Um, and, you know, this is a very disheartening experience for, for many of us. And I, I think any academic can tell you uh, a, a dozen stories like that where, uh, where you've experienced that kind of thing. Um, and um, and what, what's the obvious outcome of that, right? Is that, well, is someone, I, the next time I'm asked to serve on a committee, I think, why should I waste my time here? You guys aren't going to take me seriously. This is going to be a huge time commitment for me. And, um, and no one's going to listen. So, so that just demobilizes people to do this. And then, of course, it's a, it's a kind of vicious circle at that point, right? Because if the faculty don't give their opinions, then no one else is being, uh, no one else's opinion is being um, solicited. So, so, so then the decisions get made even more unilaterally. So, so you know, I, to, whether this is an intentional strategy or just an unhappy outcome is, I guess, a little bit irrelevant, but everything moves in the same direction. 100%. Um, and just so you know, commentary, everybody. So we're having a little issue with your mic, Mike. I don't know if my mic is breaking up for you too as well. I'm, we're hearing a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. We're hearing a little bit. My... Yeah. Maybe, maybe try that um, and see if that makes, makes a difference. Okay. All right. All sorry right. about so, that. Yeah. Sorry about everybody, but you know, as everybody knows, right. Periodically, the internet does things <laughs> beyond our control. The gremlins take over. Okay. Yeah. So good. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, your piece here. Let's get in. Why Jason Wingard? I mean, you know, for all practical purposes, the guy spent less than two years at temple um, left after kind of major controversies. Um, and, and yet you want to kind of dig into his book on higher education and uh, his whole skillification agenda that he brought to Temple and beyond. So can you talk a little about what his agenda is and why you think it's important, why it was think that you thought it was important to pay attention to what he's doing? Yeah, so I guess the first thing I'll say is I had never heard of Jason Wingard until this, this Temple um, hubbub happened. And, um, and in, in retrospect, um, you know, I think it was probably from his perspective, a, a, a big mistake to have reacted the way he did. You know, the, what, what happened for, for listeners who might not know is that the Temple graduate students who've been unionized for, um, for a, a, some two decades or more, and I think 25 years maybe, um, they uh, had, you know, negotiated contracts in the past with uh, university administrations at Temple and never had any major problems as far as I know, and never, certainly never had any strikes. This time they were unable to negotiate a new contract with the, with the, the current administration. And, um, and they went on strike. Now, nothing, you know, in that regard, there's nothing particularly unusual about that because there have been uh, dozens of graduate student um, either unionization campaigns and strikes. And of course, the I'm sure all your listeners know the, the major strike in California, yep. tens of thousands, something like 40 or 45,000 or something like that. Um, graduate students and postdocs in California were on strike last last year. Um, so so there's a, a wave of unionization and kind of labor activism uh, washing across higher ed. And, um, and, and that wave um, smashed into Temple University. And what made Temple unusual, if not unique, is that they reacted in a very aggressive manner. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that this had ever happened in the, in the world of higher ed. And what they did almost as soon as the, as the graduate students went on strike, um, about a week later, the graduate students, uh, actually without any announcement, they weren't warned about this, they found out that their health insurance had been canceled. Um, and, you know, the health insurance was provided by the university and the, the university's position was, well, if you're not working, we're not going to provide you health insurance. Um, but what this meant is when students went to pick up their medication at the pharmacy, they, they suddenly couldn't get it. They said, sorry, your, your health insurance was canceled. <laughs> so this can be um, not just anxiety provoking, but, you know, a downright uh, uh, danger to people's health um, when, when, when they're reliant on some kind of medication like that. And um, I've never heard of this. I mean, you know, this seemed, this seemed to pull the, pull the mask off, right? This is using using access to healthcare as a kind of tool of, of worker discipline, right? Let's get people back to work. And then on top of that, then they sent, um, they sent notices saying, well, since you're not TAing anymore, you, you owe us tuition because to graduate students get tuition remission for when they, when they do the, for, for their teaching. Um, and then, so they said, instead of, um, instead of paying you, you, you now owe us $20,000 or whatever it was. Um, and by the way, late fees will start accruing next month. So, so this was all very aggressive, amazingly hostile response and it, and it backfired i would say on wingard and on temple it, because it drew you know quite a bit of attention national attention to a relatively small strike um and and that was what got a lot of people interested in in wingard um and in what was going on at temple 
And it turned out that, that the president of the university, Jason Wingard, had written a book, published a book last year um, on uh, the future of higher education. Um, and, you know, I, I, I confess I hadn't read the book, never heard, never heard of the book, never heard of uh, Wingard before this happened, but, but people began reading it. There was a really fabulous essay um, in the LA Review of Books that came out about a, a month before mine, which, which um, unpacked his agenda to a certain extent. And then, so the, the, anyway, the Chronicle of Higher Ed got, um, the, the reviews editor got in touch and said, would you like to review his book? And I said, yeah, uh, I, I would. <laughs> um, so, um, so I did. And the book was the book was interesting. By the time the the essay came out, Wingard had resigned. So I ended up kind of re rewriting rewriting the book, uh, rewriting the essay. Uh, you know, try to decenter Wingard from this. But but I really came to think that Wingard's book it's called the College Devaluation Crisis: Market Disruption, Diminishing ROI, and an Alternative Future of Learning. Now, you know, in the title itself, there's all these kind of um, academic buzzwords or or administrative buzzwords, um, and you know, I. The book is really poorly written, um, and it, and it's not very good. But it does it does really um, present in a very I think um, in a very stark way a, a, a vision for higher education for the future of higher education, uh, which is widely shared widely shared among the boards of trustees that we've been talking about um, among among the state legislatures that fund higher education in the country uh, even in, in higher, you know, upper echelons of the federal government and in the, in the um, Department of Education, I think, and I, and I think it's a vision, you know, it's a vision that's, that's shared to some extent across partisan divides. Um, Democratic yep. and Republican administrations have, have, I think, bought into this. Um, in certain ways, the Democratic, you know, the Obama administration really bought into this um, in a very big way. And what it is, is, um, is a vision of higher ed as purely an economic good. Higher education um, is shorn from any understanding of, of citizenship, of cultivation of the intellect, of you know whatever you know sort of airy fairy idea one might have about education, um, and it's 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 um, narrowed down to a to a sort of economistic nuts and bolts idea, which is all about um, providing worker future workers with skills to enter the labor market um, of the 21st century, and even even within that vision for higher education, for the purpose of higher education, um, for the purpose of, e of education is what I would say, not just higher education, but for the purpose of education. Even if, you, even if you accept that premise that that is the purpose of education, it still is full of, of um, fascinating contradictions and, and paradoxes, I, I, I found. Um, so, you know, so I began in that, in that essay, I sort of tried to, to spin out what, what, you know, not just what was at stake for thinking about higher education and the purpose of higher education, but um, but really, for a whole vision of of society that understands, um, you know what what I guess I, I specifically didn't you know purposefully didn't use the term neoliberal in the essay, um, but it is what I think many people would would call a neo neoliberal vision of of society in which everybody is a kind of independent autonomous entrepreneur where you know each of us is is our own entrepreneur basically, and we all accumulate a set of um, of skills that we then deploy in the labor market. To to um, to sell our our, our labor um, uh, according to skills, you know, and and in, you know, in this vision for society, I mean, uh, power imbalances don't really exist, you know. So so I can sell my if I'm not able to get a job, it's because I haven't been properly skilled. I haven't skilled myself properly. Um, it's not because there are structural conditions to to, to the you know world in which in which poverty is um, is constructed by social policy. It's because I'm not properly skilled, um, and so it's a very it's a very convenient kind of um, ideology, I think, for explaining uh, economic inequality, for explaining all kinds of social ills, because you can you can basically put that at the feet at the feet of the individual, rather than trying to look at larger structural explanations for for things that might not be working the way we would like in our in our society. Right, and you you mentioned this too as well. And you, it's like there's the world as presented, right? The, the world that they through their lens, right? So if you take like something like gig work, right? So from 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 these folks, from this agenda that we see in Wingard, right? Gig work is kind of like 
Yes, it's an opportunity for individuals to express their creativity and kind of flexibility and show their entrepreneurship freed from the structures of the past, right? It's just like, it's this heroic kind of like freeing narrative, right? As opposed to gig work as a means for breaking the backs of unions, right? Um, kind of disrupting the kind of like the working class and driving down wages and for you so you can accumulate more profit through these kind of little Silicon Valley kind of app-based things. I mean, that's the kind of contrast you see between these folk, th these narratives, right? The story that they're trying to tell, right? Which does seem, as you mentioned at one point in the article, Silicon Valley hucksterism, right? Versus like what a more kind of like direct analysis of the past 30 years of what's been happening both in our economy and in higher education would lead to us in a very different kind of direction, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And and so so it's a very convenient kind of vision. I mean, it helps us understand um, inequality in and, and poverty um, and discrimination. And, and you know, it, hel it helps us narrativize that in ways that are uh, that are less um, disturbing. Right there. They can be blamed on individuals. Um, and, you know, and then so so there so there is a kind of ideological work that happens. But then there's also a very kind of um, material or commercial work that's going on along the side, right? Because yeah, let's talk oh, about the main players that we got going on here. <laughs> yeah. Well, so these are all, these are all companies. I mean, I, uh, that I've never heard of, um, but that are playing an increasing role in, um, in higher education. You call so, this right. The alternative educational ecosystem, right? That's right. That's right. Uh, he uses words like landscape and ecosystem a lot. Um, and, uh, and you know, more or less what I would call this is the is the privatization of, of higher education. So it's the kind of outsourcing of a lot of functions of higher education to private companies, for profit companies, and mostly startups in what you know, in what Silicon Valley calls ed tech. Um, and these are these are companies that have that have grown very rapidly with, you know, almost all of them funded by venture capital. Um, and, um, and that, you know, some of them have gone on to, to uh, IPOs to, to, you know, to great effect. Some others have just been bought up by, by large companies, large multinational corporations. But there are play companies like, um, like Noodle, which, which uh, is an, uses uh, learning designers to outsource content creation. So, you know, translated, that means, that means we can, we can um, teach our classes through this, through this, uh, through, through this platform. These are, these are the, um, there's Practera, which is a fast growing experiential education technology and programs company that uh, provides custom customizable platforms to author, launch and manage experiential learning programs. There's a lot of jargon in this, in this world of ed tech. Um, a lot of it is kind of nonsense if you ask me, but, but, um, but these are, you know, these are basically taking the functions that are, that have traditionally been done by, well, that used to be done by tenure track professors, 100%. Uh, and then were done by um, adjunct professors, um, contingent, you know, labor, and and I think the next stage of that process is, is to completely outsource them to these private companies, which can provide, um, which can provide what what would have been a, a classroom experience online, um, and do that in a very standardized way, so that the so that the instructor can expand. You know, I, I I'm sort of limited as my as a professor, right? I can if I want to teach a seminar, I probably should limit that to around 30 people if I want it to be uh, effective at all. If I want to teach a lecture class, you know, in a, in a room, perhaps I could teach, uh, you know, in a large lecture hall, maybe I could teach 300, 400 or something like that with a, with a group of TAs. But here with this kind of thing, you know, I can put a, a course online or not I, but someone who's paid to, um, to create this content can put a course online and teach potentially thousands, hundreds of thousands or more. Um, and, and so- It should be said too, is that once you do that, Right. Once you get into kind of like the developers or the creatives to develop this kind of content to put online, you don't even need those people anymore. Right. You can just run this as kind of a series of modules that kind of can get graded by, you know, whatever rubric, you know, maybe you need people initially, but eventually you could turn this over to AI to kind of use this rubric to grade all these people to issue them their certificate. Right. Absolutely, absolutely, and and a lot of this content isn't so much going to be created. Even even if I were to let's say record a lecture, it wouldn't be created by necessarily by people who are specialists in early, you know, teach a class in early American history. It wouldn't be teach taught by necessarily somebody who has a PhD in early American history. It might be taught by a um, it might be taught by a, a learning design specialist or something like that, right? Um, who who has who you know who um, has been trained in perhaps in some kind of pedagogical. Uh, uh, you know, um, abilities or, or, or not, maybe not, maybe that was outsourced already. And then, um, and then, you know, maybe I was brought in to consult, uh, and make sure that, you know, do a little bit of fact checking to make sure that they're not getting anything fundamentally wrong. 
uh, and then and then that would get that would get um, spun off right by by a company like this and and um, and then reproduced at infinitum and and then you know and then the, the person who would have served as professor can be turned into a kind of coach right that's how they that's how they see this and and you for these coaches you don't need a PhD for that um, at best you need a maybe a, a master's degree or, or maybe not even and you just you're there to, to sort of help the student along uh, uh, through through this learning environment or whatever whatever one would call it so you probably just need like a certificate in kind of like higher education learning delivery, right? <laughs> that's right. Yeah, something like that. Exactly. Exactly. And I could probably teach a dozen or, or two dozen classes, not teach because, you know, sort of mentor and, and help students along on this thing. Um, so you can see how from a certain perspective, this is um, this is marvelous, right? Because this this allows you to slash costs uh, in, in a big way. I mean, one of the major costs for universities, of course, in, in addition to facilities is 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 um, uh, labor. You know, as a cost of instructors. So, so if you can reduce that, if you can reduce that, um, you you are providing a much cheaper form of education. Whether you're well, you're providing a much cheaper form of something. Whether you can even call that education at that point is you know is up for grabs. But but it, it is certainly much cheaper to to, to do. Um, and not incidentally, the the profits from that you know don't go into let's say the pockets of the people who are doing the work they go into the, you know an awful lot of that gets diverted to the to the shareholders of these companies that are providing this right and let's talk about you know they're the, you know, these companies that are these companies that are kind of you know having all this innovation going on in the ed tech world you know it'd be one thing if they're kind of making all these pitches and using all this kind of like you know huckster language and all this stuff but we're talking about companies for example you list in here you've got like like uh, you know, companies that are worth like $3.5 billion, $2.7 billion, right? Um, you know, looking at like, you're talking multi-million or billion dollar corporations, companies that are seeking to basically skim the profit away, you know, take the basic, big what you're doing, right? You're displacing where the money's going. Instead of the money going to faculty and instructors and research, it's going to go to these companies, right? In exchange for, you know, a more controllable um, workforce, if it will. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you know, and to, from my mind, you know, there's a there's a there's a sad irony because this has already been going on for an awful long time. As I right. you know, as I said earlier, this almost feels like the final stage of a process that's been going on for ages. I mean, a, a, gen, a couple generations ago in the 1960s, early 70s, two thirds of instructors in higher ed were tenure to tenure track, and you know that now we're down to one third. Most most people who teach in the world of higher education teach in, in grim conditions. You know, they are underpaid. They don't have any job security. Um, and, you know, you have all these stories of people like living out of their cars or, you know, being on public assistance and all kinds of things who are teaching. So, so we've already, we've already gone pretty, pretty far down this road of slashing, um, slashing the cost of, of, act, of doing the actual teaching. And so this, is, this does feel like one sort of last stage, one, one more step in a direction that we've already gone pretty far along. Yeah, 100%. And so maybe the way of kind of drilling into this just a bit right here about that direction and that kind of consolidation is that kind of toward the end of your essay, too, is what you're talking about, um, this whole term that Wingard used about skillification. And this is one of these things that brought it down and say, what is, what is all this focus on skills? Because I think like most, say, faculty members or students, for that matter, when, you, when we talk about skills, Right. Generally, we're thinking about things like, OK, some practically deployable, say, kind of knowledge or practice or kind of ways of doing stuff that allows us to navigate, a, say, a particular kind of problem. Right. Or that kind of stuff. Um, you know, in my university, we, we, you know, my university system, they start talking about upskilling. Right. So you hear all this kind of like language about skills. But you kind of hone in on this part. We say, well, well, that's probably not what uh, we might all think that. And, you know, the public at large and politicians and even university presidents, for that matter, or university faculty, you know, could be excused for thinking that was what a skill was, because that's probably the way most people think about skills. You say, no, for them, skills is something else. Can you talk us a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this was <laughs> so here's another here's another area where it feels as though we're reaching the, the stage of parity rather than, um, anything, you know, so um, we for. You know, I, I teach history. I teach in the humanities, um, as I think you, you do too, right? Yes, I do. Yep. Um, and so, for, you know, for those of us in the kind of beleaguered humanities, uh, it, we've spent most of our careers hearing about how you don't learn anything practical if you if you um, if you are a student in the humanities, right? Yep. Um, and so, universities have been shifting, and this is this has been going on for for decades now. They've been shifting into these more applied fields, right? So, uh, we all hear about STEM: science, technology, engineering, and math. These are the these are the main 
uh, things that we need to be teaching our, our future workers for because we don't want them learning the useless useless things like um, how to how to write a history paper or how to how to you know deconstruct a I don't know a Shakespeare sonnet or something like that right that's not gonna that's not gonna give us the jobs of the 21st century so all this emphasis on uh, applied skills on applied uh, kind of applied education that um, and um, and then you know you start to ask well what does this mean you know concretely like what do we what do we want workers to to future workers to actually learn and you know presumably this is things like um, like coding uh, or you know <laughs> whatever the things that will actually you know yeah is something that will get you a job right at, right out of uh, right out of um, graduate school right out of college and this is what you know this is what the employers are always complaining about right we 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 have these students coming out of these fancy you know bachelor of art programs and we have to train them to do the things that we want them to be doing as though that's a crazy idea that they should <laughs> train their workers. Um, so, so, uh, so we've been pushing people in that direction. And then there, are, you know, there are several, I think, fascinating um, kind of ironies that, that come out of this. One, one is that um, when when you actually ask the employers, uh, um, you know, concretely, like, what is it that you want your students to know? Uh, is it something like coding? I mean, is that what you what you want them to know, uh, or do you want them to know, like, uh, I don't know, massage therapy or something like that? You're just like, well, actually. You know, you'll, you'll ask them, well, what, what we really want them to know, we want them to be problem solvers, right? The, the work of coding is always changing, right? You can learn how to code today, but in, in a year, many of those skills will be outdated. So what you need to learn is how to be a, a, a learner. You need to learn skills of critical thinking. We want people who can write well, who can communicate well. Um, and, and those, you know, over and over are the, um, are the, the yep. skill, the, the sort of skills that, that, um, that employers say they want. And, and so then, you know, you pause for a second, you say, wait a second, those were the things I thought that's what I was teaching in my history classes, 100%. right? Critical yeah. thinking, how to write, um, how to, how to, how to, um, pose problems, how to ask questions, how to communicate clearly, how to present your, how to present data, right? These are the things that I thought I was teaching in my class, but I was told, no, 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 history is useless. Go into engineering, learn coding, whatever it might be. Um, so, so that's irony number one. Um, but irony number two is by the time I got to the end of this book, this um, kind of awful but fascinating book, uh, I, I um, was puzzled. You know, what, what exactly is, are the skills that, that um, Wingard is talking about? Because he's not talking about, although the employers tell him from time to time, we want critical thinking. That's not actually what he's talking about. Um, and what, what emerges by the end of this book is a really... Uh, amazing, I think, sort of, I called it a plot twist in my, <laughs> in my essay, which is that a skill doesn't really have any content. Um, a skill, uh, as, as they are, um, uh, as they're described, you know, I say, you know, it's, it's only near the, the end of the book that you actually learn. It's not something, it's not a, an aptitude that you learn in, in, uh, in a classroom setting or even in a, in a practical setting. It's actually what, it, what um, someone tells Wingard is the descriptor of work. It's a common vocabulary or an important currency. So we've gone into we've gone into this sort of um, uh, as I see it a kind of financialized world in which um, in which uh, skills have become something that can be read uh, that can be read by employers by HR departments really um, as uh, you know so you, so you provide a kind of fake education um, and then provide a fake certification so that the HR department in in a company can read that fake certification and place you in exactly the right sort of um, sort of uh, slot. Um, and so I, I quote from some of these figures, you know, so the, there's a, a company chief learning officer who says that people will eventually begin to think of themselves in, in terms of skills, and that can turn into projects, roles, opportunities, and laid off workers who lack the startup capital to invest in themselves can contract themselves out to merit, merit-based financing startups. This is something that, by the way, has been out there lately, right? This is yeah. seen as a kind of solution to the higher to the student debt problem instead of taking on debt why don't you why don't you become a, a um award, source award of the corporation <laughs> exactly Sorry. we'll get we'll get capital to invest in you and then you can pay <laughs> dividends to your investors as you um as you some come to gain income right um and so this is the ultimate stage in a kind of financialized version of the worker right the worker who doesn't actually have a, a skill that is to say i can't sit down and make a, a i don't know make a copper tubing or something like that right i actually am I am I am um, selling off my skills before they've even been um, acquired, so that someone else can gain the revenue from my future labor. It's it's a really extraordinary kind of um, it's a it's an extraordinary kind of vision, I think, and and it emerges if you read sort of between the lines of what these people are saying. Well, one hundred percent, and I think that you know, I think when you 
got these, kind of, you know, I, I don't know. I've been saying this for a while. I, I've told this story before on the show, and I don't want to go too long. I know I'm keeping you longer than I, than I promised you to begin with. But I, it's like, I, I remember I, I read this book um, by Winners Take All. I know it's Anand Girdardas, right? And um, he was writing about this, this, this fiction about how philanthropy and these kind of like rich Silicon Valley enlightened billionaires are going to basically save us all through their philanthropic um, kind of giving. Right. And of course he starts to break down in this book, the, um, the, the language of Silicon Valley of innovation of everything you basically are talking about in this essay. Right. And I was listening to it as an audio book back and forth. I got about an hour commute. I was listening to an audio book coming back and forth from work. And I finished it this one day. I was sitting in my parking lot, like at work for that, that last like few paragraphs here and the our new chancellor chancellor dan greenstein uh who came out of uh, the bill and melinda gates foundation came out of the ran their higher ed division is all this kind of ed tech kind of guy he was actually visiting he just got um, appointed to be chancellor and he was he was at Kutztown university that day um to kind of you know well you know do his welcome talk his, his tour of the campuses and I literally, I walked from my car directly to where he was giving his talk, right? So I get there, I sit down, and I was like, holy crap. Everything I just read about and the critique of all this stuff, the things that you're talking about in this essay were coming out of this guy's mouth, right? And I mean, it was the kind of thing where I say, well, whatever. And what, it began, what I started to realize over time, he's saying all these words to all of us as if we, faculty and students and the community at large, that we're the audience, right? But we're not. And what you just said, this stuff about skills, right? This idea is as an exchangeable currency among who? University presidents and businesses and all these people in these ed tech firms. So it's an interchangeable commodity. Whereas the students, you know, the so-called, the ones that inhabit the skills, right? They're irrelevant here. They're just basically t telling employers about how to think about the workforce in such a way that is going to get them more money. That's the way I kind of come, I, I, like I walk away from this stuff because I find this so disgusting, right? That you're going to, it's a, a dehumanization of, of faculty, of students, and frankly, of our kind of like entire sort of social order, if you will. And I, and I don't mean to kind of go too hyperbolic here, but I mean, this kind of language, right? And as you have correctly said, of course, this has been a long march, right? They've been on this train for, you know, since the 1960s and slowly kind of gutting what has happened in kind of higher education. But to see now that people are getting appointed, right, um, to head positions at place Temple University and elsewhere to carry out this agenda, right? And knowing that the victims of this are not only just going to be us as faculty, but are going to be those students who are then going to be released into this world that is going to expect them to somehow piece together a living right, um, by selling themselves to the, to the highest bidder. I mean, it's disgusting to me. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's sort of, I think, it's a, it's a little bit of a stage, the stage of capitalism we're in, right? I mean, we've, we've moved, we de-industrialized, and then we turned ourselves into a service economy. And then, and then once you um, reduce the need for, for uh, service itself, right, for labor itself, what do you do with the capital? You, you, you can invest in, yep. um, you, you can invest in, in individuals without as, without actually individuals as laborers, right? Individuals as, as, um, as as um, objects of capital, and and so there's something you know uh, extraordinary going on there for sure. There's, I think you know, the, so the the book that you talk about, Winners Take All, is a I think it's a, just a really great book, and um, it's been a little while since I read that book, but but you know one of the things that I take away from that book is that the you know the people who uh, created the world that we live in and, and who most benefit from the world that we live in um, aren't going to solve the problems generated by that right. world, right? And, and if we think they are, we're fooling ourselves. Um, and, you know, it all, it all, in a sense, comes full circle, right? Because um, those people, the ones that you're talking about, I mean, the, these, these billionaire philanthropists, these are the people who sit on the boards of universities, right? I mean, they, they are, um, they're the people who are ultimately calling the shots in the institution where I teach and where you teach. Um, and, you know, and there is an intimate, I think, um, relationship between those people and between the kind of foundation world that you're talking about, uh, you know, like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and, but not just that one. I mean, they, they've been particularly interested in education and kind of changing the way that education is delivered. But, um, but I think there's an awful lot of foundations that have been uh, that have been doing this work. And I don't, I don't mean by any stretch to sound conspiratorial here, because um, I think you know, the way they see it, they're they're doing good work. You know, doing important work, good work. I mean, this is well-meaning. Um, well-meaning donations, right? I don't think people are, right. are understanding yep. this as a kind of uh, insidious plot to, you know, to transform the nature of higher education. But, but, but they, you know, they come out of a kind of, um, 
sort of uh, <laughs> ecosystem, if we can use uh, Wingard's words, they come out of a kind of epistemologic, epistemological uh, 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 context in which, you know, in which, it, in which it makes sense to, um, to transform higher education in, in this way that will not incidentally also generate profit, right, and, and cut, cut costs. Um, and so, you know, I, I had a really interesting exchange. One of the people who reached out to me after the, the um, after the article came out was somebody named Neil Neil Krauss, who teaches in at Wisconsin, um, and he he's written a book where where that will be coming out soon, where he talks about where where did this idea of uh, education as skillification, right? Education as generating skills for workers. Where did this really come from? And he traces it back to a um, he traces it back to the early 1980s. When um, when there was a, a, a kind of move to to um, blame unemployment and other things on the skills gap, right? And he said this was this was basically invented. I mean, this is something. This is an idea I kind of bumped into in my essay, kind of a, I think a little unwittingly actually. But um, this was all sort of invented the the skills gap um, by these foundations that began to 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 measure what they understood to be skills. Um, uh, among you know the, the skills that were needed uh, by workers or and by the employment economy and the skills that weren't being provided by the educational system and this became this became one of the wedges through which um, people could uh, could begin really critiquing and trying to reform higher education um, as something that needed to be much more practical much more focused on something and and as I say I sort of bumped into this idea in my essay which is like wh what is this alleged skills gap that we have right because um, you know, Wingard even says at one point, we've got all these workers with skills who, who aren't getting employed. Um, and, you know, and then you have these employers saying, we want we want skills that, that liberal arts education has been providing. Um, so so what is this skills gap that supposedly exists? Um, and according to, to Neil Krauss, it's, you know, it's largely it's largely made up. Um, and, and they rely, he, he goes back through BLS data, Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, and and he's he says, you know, if you look at the government data, um, there, there is no skills gap, actually. You know, it's it's kind of an invented concept by people who just have a hunch that that this is what explains um, kind of structural features like unemployment. Right? Yeah, it's it's remarkable, and it goes it goes right to. I mean, this is a whole other show to talk about what they did through K through twelve through exactly this logic of this skills gap, um, and you know, this is like the birth of the kind of the big data solution, the billionaire solution to like problems in education which their own kind of like findings like years later, there was, you know, the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, of course, had this, you know, this had a huge impact what happened to K through 12. And then you had, they, they said, okay, we're gonna get the RAND Corporation, you know, that libertarian think tank, we're gonna get them to study like how successful this has been. And the RAND, Rand Corporation came back after all this study and all this is like, yeah, it's kind of negligible. <laughs> so yeah. so like, we turned up like up, like completely undid the entire way that we did K through 12 education. Now they're trying to do exactly the same thing to higher education, or I, more correctly, as you've been saying, they have been doing this and kind of leading us to where we are today. So let me ask you this as a way of kind of, of kind of not leaving us in kind of my preferred space of the dystopian future. <laughs> but, but, you know, one thing you do mention, like, look, look, you know, it's kind of like, you know, part part kind of warning, part call, um, part kind of acknowledgement about what it's gonna take. And you basically say, look, unless there's a much broader coalition that is gonna push back against this stuff, this could very well be our future, right? Um, and it's kind of going down, you know, the downward spiral, spiral race to the bottom all over again. So given the fact that, you know, say the birth of looking at this book was at the temple and what was going on in the temple strike, are there, do you see, any kind of signs of that kind of coalition or kind of hopes in a direction that's pushing back against some of this kind of like, you know, Silicon Valley hucksterism that is kind of looking to kind of degrade higher ed? I, I think so. I mean, I don't know if I'm being naively optimistic after being so so critical and depressing here, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but the, there, you know, there are there are certainly reasons to be hopeful about about the future. Um, one of them has to do with the. One of them is is in the strike itself, right? In the in the graduate student strike. Uh, I mean, look look who's out of a job right now. It's it's Wingard, right? It's not it's not the graduate students. They ultimately won. They got a contract. It didn't get didn't get them everything they wanted, and still doesn't give them a living wage actually. But <laughs> but it's a big improvement over what they had. They get some parental leave. They get some. They get they get health care for their um, dependents, and they get they got a substantial pay raise. So. Um, so, so they they won a lot, and and Wingard got fired. You know, so so even right there, there's there's some sign for hope. And what what is it that led to that? Well, it was it was labor action, right? It was yep. it was solidarity. Um, it was labor action by the students, and it was ultimately the solidarity of the faculty that that um, was outraged by by the actions of 
um, of Wingard, not just the faculty, but other, but but the students um, and the broader community, right? The, the kind of media attention that this brought, um, which uh, you know, which which pushed which pushed Wingard out, and and may well push the the president of the board of trustees. I haven't been following actually in the last few days, but so so that's something. Then there's of course all the broader labor action that I alluded to earlier, right? Across higher education last well, year, Rutgers, with the, the Rutgers strike that still kind of potentially they might go back on the line if they don't get this thing. I mean, there's there's a Amazing yeah, example and, of solidarity across across even divisions. You're not kidding. That I think that one is even more impressive, actually, than than perhaps the the graduate student strike in California was an impressive run, not just because of its size, which I mean it was huge, right? This yep. was forty some thousand workers, um, but also because the postdocs the postdocs got what they wanted and then stayed on strike to support the graduate students. There's so there's solidarity, right? And then the there, the um, the the grad the, the the strike at Rutgers is is the most impressive of all of the ones that I've seen. Again, this is not my field. You know, this is I'm sort of a dilettante in this area. I follow it as a um, as an activist, not as a scholar. But um, but uh, I think that's the most impressive that I've seen right now. Because what was that strike fundamentally about? It was fundamentally about the adjunctification yep. of higher education, right? Of, of of teaching and the people like me, right? The tenured faculty who have secure perks. And, and actually whose perks, and we have to say this, we have to be honest and open and frank about this, are the perks of our, um, you know, like the benefits that we get as, as salaried protected wage employees come at the expense of the people who are exploited, of the adjunct workers who are, who are doing our teaching in part, right? Um, so that, it, rather than pitting the privileged uh, elite faculty against the underprivileged um, toiling, you know, masses, if I can put it that way, I don't mean that at all to be a, no, to, to no. make that sound denigrating. Um, to, instead of pitting those two uh, against each other, this, this strike brought them in, in alliance, right? So that, so the tenured faculty were in support of better working conditions, better wages, um, better benefits for adjunct labor. And, and that in my mind is the most hopeful thing that I've, that I've seen. And, and they look like they're on the cusp of, of winning that because ultimately you know, we can't turn higher education around if um, if the labor conditions don't improve, right? If we don't if we don't reverse the system by you know this 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 massive trend by which we have um, increasingly um, turned teaching into a precarious employment, um, into into contingent employment, into underpaid labor. Uh, so so that's an incredibly hopeful thing. Um, and to push back ultimately against you know I think the next stage then is to figure out how are we going to govern these institutions in ways. That are going to better reflect the values that these institutions are meant to be um, embodying and meant to be promoting, and the kinds of work they're meant to be doing within within society. I don't mean to be utopian here. I don't think universities are going to solve um, all our social problems, but you know, but they do. They they do and should stand apart from the kind of for profit world um, of the of much of the economy. And um, and and until we you know until we have a kind of leadership that recognizes that these are these are different entities. Um, and that they have different purposes and they do different things and they can't be governed by the same rules that apply to, you know, the widget makers. Um, I think we're, you know, we're in big trouble. So, so this is, this seems to me the first stage, right? A kind of labor, labor action, labor solidarity, and ultimately moving through the kind of political system, um, both through institutionally within universities and then ultimately in the broader political system. I think that's how change is going to happen. And there are, there are glimmers that this is happening. There really are. 100%. And I, you know, I can't think of a better, a better place to close this out. And like 100%, you know, this is like what we're seeing over and over again. It's like, do we have like the hope that, you know, you know, the, 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 the solutions are going to trickle down right <laughs> from these folks or, uh, you know, what we've been saying in this program for, for years, right. It's organized, like organizing and direct action, which are going to get the goods. Um, and the more that the broader that coalition, um, the broader that we kind of organize both in our communities around our workplaces around the more that we have kind of hope for the future um, kind of of our kind of immediate lives, right. And the future of this country and of democracy itself. So uh, Francois, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate having you on the show to me. Thank Thank you so much for your work and thanks for coming on it's been a pleasure bring me back sometime oh you got it 100 percent i'll bet you can you now now <laughs> you've caused yourself a problem because you know i'm going to be like uh hey listen i saw that article come out here you want to get back on i'd love to have you back on in the future It'd be fantastic All right. this has been fun really yeah, fun 100 so everybody want to make sure you check this out uh francois first firstenberg's article it's called higher ed's grim soulless ed techified future i cannot recommend it enough if you have any problem getting access to that you just let me know and i'll make sure you get yourself a copy how's that all right so this is 
Kevin Mahoney, creator and founder of Raging Chicken. I want to remind you that you can help support the show by heading over to patreon.com slash rcpress. Uh, we will be back on Friday with our Friday Politics Roundup, and we'll be back on uh, May 8th with – uh, yeah, that's going to be a great show. I mean, the show on May 8th, I just got to say, you got to come up, come back. Mark Engler will be on the show. Uh, we're going to be talking about his uh, article, Can Movements Keep Politicians from Inevitably, show, inevitably Selling Out? Um, so stick around. We're going to tell you what's going to be on our May 1st show. I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, all the work ahead. Organize. That's the only solution, everybody. We all know that. Let's get out and do it. All right, have a great weekend, everybody. We'll be back. Or what weekend? What am I talking about? Have a great week, everybody. We'll be back to see you on Friday. I'm out of here. See ya!